When I speak, I would like you to think about one question. Why is Scandinavia so rich? One reason could be that we are sharing so much. Then we get a common interest to make a big pie, because we're going to share it in any case. It isn't the only explanation, but this is the explanation I would like you to have in mind. And I move on now to think more about developing countries, India and other countries. But many countries are not so fortunate as us. They are not sharing as much as we do, and they do much worse. For example, uh, Rwanda is a tragic example. The big genocide in uh, 1994. It wasn't only uh, a bad economic catastrophe, but it was also a human catastrophe, as you all know. 800,000 people were killed just in 100 days. And you see, here's a graph over the GDP development over the period. You see, there's a tremendous drop in 1994. It was actually a drop in production of equal size of the drop in production in the Great Depression in the US. Greater, actually. But you also see a, a path where it's increasing after the things uh, went better. Both the, both the tragedy in 1994, the consequences of that, and the prosperity that followed after were very unequally shared in the population. And this is typical. Many countries in Africa and elsewhere have a lot of conflict. In Africa, there's 80% of, of all countries in Africa have at least one year of, of civil war since 1980. And elsewhere, the conflicts are more simmering, maybe. They are not sort of brutal, as we have seen here, but they are there. And they are destroying some of the economic performance of the, of the country. And the lives that people live are worse than they needed to be. So um, we need a solution for this. And um, the solution I'm going to talk about is uh, universal basic income to people everywhere, in principle. Uh, together with a colleague of mine, uh, an Indian economist working at the New York University, Debrash Ray. Uh, we have explored the possibility of using universal basic, what we call a universal basic share, which is a simple amendment to uh, uh, this uh, universal basic income. Uh, the, it is an amendment in the sense that you are committing to a share of the total income in the country that is shared by everybody. Everybody is getting equal much of this 10%, say, share of the total uh, incomes in the country. And uh, we're going to now look at some consequences of that, and I'm going to give you some examples. So this is a universal basic share. So uh, it has three sets of consequences. And they are, it reduces poverty and inequality, that's one thing. It increases the social insurance offered to people, and it reduces conflicts. Each of these three things, the universal basic share has a direct effect on each of these uh, three uh, entities here. It uh, reduces poverty, obviously, because you take 10% of the income in the country and you give it to everybody. That means that the poor people get much more than they had. In India, 10% of the income uh, would mean that you give the poverty line, an amount equal to the poverty line in uh, 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 in that country. You increase the social insurance because now there's a certain level you can't fall below that. If there's a drought in the country, well, then you, uh, you are not having the bad consequences of running into debt in order to feed your family. It reduces conflicts because now the group that you represent, say, that will also lose if there is a conflict and, and production goes down because you get lower basic income via the basic universal share. But the most interesting thing is the interaction between these things. That you have that uh, reduced conflicts in itself is a social insurance because it stabilizes the economy. Reduced poverty eliminates some of the conflicts. Reduced inequality eliminates some of the conflicts over which you can fight and, and have tremendous bad consequences. To increase social insurance, make people more secure to invest in good performance and in prosperity. So they interact these things. Let me see how, um, whether we can find any Indian experiments that can sort of 
show some of this. We cannot find any experiences where they use the universal basic share, because that's why we have it as an ID, that it hasn't been uh, tried before. But there are some experiments where they use uh, uh, universal basic income. There were 6,500 uh, people that were given basic income in India in, under the administration of, uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, Self-Employed Women's Association um, <coughs> in 2009 to 2012. So they received an amount, each of them, extra for the kids, that were equal around the poverty line of, of, uh, of each uh, uh, individual. So what happened? Many people think, well, they will just waste the money, easy come, easy go, so they will waste it on temptation goods. What is happening? No, they invested, many of them invested to improve their toilets. That was the first thing they did. You know, 60% of households in, in India have to decaffeinate in the open. This is a terrible tragedy for, for women in particular in India. The first thing they did, this get them resources to improve their toilets. They invested in children, the more, uh, more schooling for children, girls in particular. Girls are discriminated in India. So they went up by 40% compared to the villages that didn't receive a basic income. And the so schooling reached a level of 65% of the girls, which is very high in Indian context. There was also better feeding in the households. Better, they got better nourished. One uh, indication of this is the weight of, of, uh, of girls compared to their age. Uh, they, those who were underweighted, that declined. So it was a, tr a double effect of this compared to the villages that didn't receive basic income. It was also the case that they didn't work less. They worked more. Then, uh, so people are afraid that basic income should lead to lower work, should look at some of the experiences where they've been tried out. They look, worked more and they worked smarter. They choose more the work they did because they were invested in, they were, have an insurance in, in the period between jobs so they can have a better uh, job all in all. And it also gave power to females in particular in the household because they got, when you get individual money, you get individual power. And, uh, and uh, you also got a bank account. You didn't have that before. You have to pay it into a bank account, and that got more control of the wages. So you should think that there are so many good things about um, these things. They are having a basic income, and in particular if it is a universal basic share, because then you lift this floor that everybody stands on in tandem with the economic growth and performance of the rest of the economies. You are not lagging behind. When there is prosperity, you get the share of the prosperity. When there is new machinery, you get the share of the benefits of the new machinery. When there is more globalization, you get the benefits, a share of the benefits of more globalization. The people will say, well, isn't, this is fine if you can pay for it. It's nice, but it's too pricey for developing countries. I would say the opposite. You become rich by uh, investing in these arrangements. You don't have to be rich in the forehand. People will say, well, but these countries are so corrupt, uh, it can be more or less true, um, we can't implement a scheme like this. But notice, this is a very transparent and simple scheme. It's 10% easy to check, you're going to be broadcasted on television that this year's bonus to everybody is so and so much, and they can check whether they got it. It's very transparent. And also, if you fight corruption, then you will... Uh, uh, benefit even more. So we get the social interest in sort of organizing a protest against corruption and because you get part of the benefit. This is why we should stand on this platform to move further in many countries. Thank you.